Well, open your Bibles to the book of Numbers, if you would, please. I am really honored to be here at my home church, and I'm grateful my pastor has given me the opportunity to preach. I watched the last two nights as much as I could. I was preaching in Wyoming. Our services started at 6, which is 8 o'clock Michigan time. So if Brother Treadway had stopped on time, I would have seen the whole sermon, but I got to see a good chunk of it as it was. And I understand I need some props. So, fellows, if you drive my tractor out now, and I'll, uh, we'll use it for something, all right? Numbers chapter 33. Thank you so much, Pastor, for letting me be here. Glad my wife is here. She's giving me good reports about the wonderful messages Brother Treadway preached on Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> of course, Pastor preached on revival, preparing us for that on Sunday. And uh, this is something the Lord put on my heart some time ago as I was beginning to pray about this meeting. Uh, the church in Wyoming graciously let me come home a day early so that I could be here for this meeting. I was originally supposed to be through Wednesday and appreciate them, appreciate you being here. Numbers 33, verse 55. The children of Israel are about to go into the promised land. Forty years of eating the same food every day. <laughs> Forty years of packing and unpacking and traveling, wearing the same clothes that God made not to wear out in the wilderness, and now they're going to have a permanent place. Houses that they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant, olive yards they didn't dig, God's going to give it to them. And he said, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, that it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do to them. Joshua chapter 23, if you would please, verse 11. Joshua's near the end of his Ministry, leading the children of Israel into the promised land, dividing the land, helping conquer the land. And he says, take good heed, therefore unto yourselves, that ye you love the Lord your God. Else, if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you. Wait a minute. What did God tell them in Numbers? How many of the nations were they supposed to allow to remain? But there they are. And now Joshua says, you didn't drive them out, but you better watch out. If you go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even those that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them, and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. They should be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. And then flip over a couple of pages, if you would please, to Judges chapter 1. Verse 21 says, The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Verse 27. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor of Tanak and her towns, nor of the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor of the inhabitants of Ablaam and her towns, nor of the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, uh, nor the inhabitants of Nahal, nor the, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Ne- neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Achcho, or the inhabitants of Zidon, or of Alab, or of Axib, or of Helba, or of Aphek, uh, nor of Rehob, but the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became tributaries unto them. 
But watch this. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain. Dan's God's people. Amorites are the pagans. Now the pagans, the ungodly that should have been driven out, are forcing the children of Dan to live in the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres and Ajalon and Shalbeam. Yet the head hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. Father, I pray that you'd guide me as I preach tonight. The very best I know, I've come to the place in your word where you want me to be. And we've had two marvelous nights, a great Sunday, wonderful faith-building offering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for people being saved. Thank you for people that are added to this wonderful church. Thank you for the leadership of our pastor and the, the fellowship of the people. Lord, I want to be a help and a blessing. I can no more help than you help me. So please empower me and direct me. Be in charge of this service. Do the work that you want in our hearts. I have a sense you want to do something significant and special in our lives. Help us to be open and responsive. In Jesus' name, amen. Two things Joshua said. Love God. Drive out the inhabitants of the land. Pretty simple. Not much on the list. Love God and get rid of those pagan people to whom the land does not belong. God's given it to you. Because if you don't, they'll become a snare. They'll be pricks in your eyes and they'll be goads in your side. You ever get something in your eye? You couldn't get it out? It bothers you all day long. You can't hardly think about anything else. It's really a bad deal. God says, this is not going to be good if you don't trust me, if you don't obey me, if you don't do what I've told you that you ought to do. Three things I want you to see from our passages tonight. The first one is this. Obstacles are always present. Would everybody say that with me, please? Obstacles are always present. Say it again. Obstacles are always present. Now, God gave them a land. He said, man, you don't have to build the house. You don't have to plant the olive vineyard. You don't have to dig out the vineyard. I'm giving it to you. Well, then it ought to be easy, right? I mean, if you're in the will of God, you never have any bills that you have trouble paying. You never have any, any trouble at your job place. You never get sick. You never have any financial... Di- no. There are always obstacles to the will of God. Some of you have made decisions during this meeting, and you've really been sincere and genuine, and already you've gone back and there's been tr- Troubles. Arguments in the home and issues in the workplace and things that came in the mail that upset you and discouraged you. And you said, wait a minute, Lord, I was sincere. I was trying to do right. Why am I having all these troubles? How come all these Canaanites are in the land? There are obstacles to the will of God. There are obstacles in the will of God. You can be in the will of God and somebody's going to oppose you. Did you know that? I think we get too uh, upset about that. Uh, I think we think it's a bigger deal than it really is. It's really just life. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Brother Treadway was telling me about a preacher he's going to preach for named Cartwright who followed Roger Staubach at Navy, broke all the records Staubach set uh, and set seven other records. And I just imagine a football player like that <coughs> and he's playing for Navy. He could have gone pro, but he got called to preach. And so he went into the Lord's work instead. And imagine him coming off the field and say, Coach, you told me to run down there and get to the end zone. Coach, I can't do that. There's all these people in my way. They're trying to knock me down. Uh, they, they hit me hard and, and they're pretty heavy and, and a whole bunch of them piled up on me. I can't get the ball down there. There's opposition. Of course there is. Of course there is. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. It looks like we may have Joe Biden for president. I know. Give me Nebuchadnezzar any day. I'll take those burning fiery furnaces and threats to have your body cut in pieces and your house made a dunghill any day over President Biden. So what? 
Did you know the gospel thrived in pagan societies where the people of God had to meet hidden in homes and in the catacombs and the mere faith that they exercised in the Lord Jesus Christ was sufficient to have them put to death. But you can't stop the gospel. Obstacles are always present. Obstacles to the will of God. Obstacles in the will of God. Wait a minute. Let me say one more thing. The obstacles are the will of God. You know what Caleb said? When they, 40 years earlier, had the chance to go to the promised land and didn't take it, they said, there's giants there. They're really harsh. They're going to destroy us. They'll eat our people up. And Joshua said, they are bread. B-R-E-A-D, bread for us. My wife makes delicious homemade bread. She gave a loaf to Lee Edwards tonight. So I want a loaf too. Well, just just become a just become an eighty-some year old widow and <laughs> widower and see what happens. Great. And you know what, bread? I like bread. I had a grilled cheese sandwich made on homemade bread tonight with real butter and a piece of ham inside there. You know what bread does? <coughs> well, the Bible says talks about bread being the, the, the staff of the Bible. talks about the bread of life as the Lord Jesus. And the Bible talks about bread. You know what bread is? It nourishes you. It's just, it sustains you. It strengthens you. Did you know that God puts opposition in our will? It's part of his will for our life because the battle makes us strong. Nobody ever gets stronger by doing nothing. Obstacles are always present. Number one, say it with me. Obstacles are always present. Number two, victory is always possible. Would you say that with me? Victory is always possible. Oh, you know, uh, we just can't do much. We, we've got all this COVID quarantine and people are scared and they're nervous and we're just kind of unholding. We're just sort of treading water. Not at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport, praise God. Our pastor got us on television. I'm told of at least two families who have come into the church because of the television program. That wouldn't even happen if it hadn't been for the quarantine. Listen to me. You say, well, we're not running the buses. I know. And when it's the right time, pastor will lead us to do that. That doesn't mean you can't visit your bus route. That doesn't mean you can't win people to Christ out on the bus route. That doesn't mean you can't still go knocking on doors and giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that the work of God has to go backwards. No, no. I don't care what the devil throws out there. I don't care how many inhabitants there are in the land. I don't care how many chariots of iron they have. I don't care how strong they are. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And victory is always possible. I, uh, do have one little prop. Two, I guess. These are, uh, these are Archie Robinson's shoes. You know, nobody's more faithful to men's prayer meeting Saturday night than Archie Robinson. Nobody's more faithful when he was able to to visit his bus route week after week after week than Archie Robinson. Nobody loved the bus ministry more than Archie Robinson. I never heard Archie say one time, well, I just guess we can't reach bus kids anymore. I don't think there's ever a game Archie Robinson coached he didn't think he could win. I don't think there was ever a time he didn't think that there were people on the bus route. Could be I think, Sherry, didn't you visit every house on your whole route at least twice a year, was it? See, see, Archie Robinson wasn't just bus captain. He pastored that bus route. And he'd pray every Saturday night. He'd always pray, oh, Lord, bless the bus ministry and help the buses to be full and help kids to come and help people to be saved. He always thought victory is possible. He's in heaven. Who's going to fill his shoes? Who's going to take his spot in the choir? Won't anybody be able to make fun of my wife like he did, but somebody can sing like he sang. 
Who's going to believe like he believed that the gospel was powerful enough to overcome all of the opposition and it didn't matter how strong the adversary was, there's always victory possible. See, the devil's got some of you thinking that there's this one habit, this one area of your life that's just always going to be a weakness and always going to be a problem and you're never going to have victory over it. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. The Bible says with men, it may be impossible, but... But with God, all things are possible. Say it with me again. Victory is always possible. It's possible in your life. It's possible in your family. It's possible in your finances. It's possible in the sin that the devil has brought into your life to try to control and enslave you. Victory is always possible. God didn't send him into the promised land to fail. God didn't give them a command that he wouldn't have helped them to fulfill. Now, God often tells us to do the impossible. Often. Mark chapter 3. Jesus at the synagogue. There's a man just in attendance. Didn't come to get help. Didn't even probably know Jesus was going to be there. He had a withered up hand. Pharisees watch it. We'll check this out. See if he's going to heal on Sabbath day. Violate our rules. Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, stand forth. And then he said, stretch forth thine hand. How embarrassing. The one thing he couldn't do. I have bad knees. Be like, tell me, jump off this platform. I could. <laughs> but I couldn't get up. <laughs> and I couldn't walk right for some time. God will often ask you to do something that seems impossible. He'll often call you to a task that is far beyond your ability to envision accomplishing. He'll often ask you to deal with a situation in life that you think is absolutely hopeless, but he always makes the impossible possible. Victory is always possible. But then I want you to see this. The remnant is always a problem. Like King Saul, the children of Israel did most of what God told them to do. They did most of it. Most of the inhabitants who were driven out, they weren't in charge anymore. The, the children of Israel, there, they were in charge, and they put them to tribute some. But they left a few around. I don't know why. I'll tell you what I think. I think they got tired of fighting. I've seen that happen with a lot of people as they get older. See, there are only six battles for 40 years in the wilderness. That's one about every <coughs> 6.8 years. There are 13 battles just under Joshua, not counting the ones individual tribes had to deal with the inhabitants of the land once they got in the promised land. There's more fighting in the promised land than there was in the wilderness. And they get rid of most of them. Two hardest parts of any job are starting and finishing. And I used to have a bad habit when I'd do jobs around the house. I'd finish mostly the job and then I'd leave my tools and the pieces of waste wood lying around. I was tired. I was just done with it. I don't want to mess with it anymore. You can, you can do 95% of a job, leave 5% undone, and everybody thinks you left a mess, and they don't give you credit for the 95% you did. But this was even worse than that, because if you leave the 5%, God says they're going to bother you. They're going to be like, like a picker sticking in your eye. They're going to be like a sharp stick in the middle of your side. God gave him a really clear principle. He said, you got to get rid of them. Got to get rid of them. And they mostly did. You know what I would imagine about the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport, crowd that's gathered here tonight, maybe listening in live stream, I would say you're mostly right with God. I would say most of the things God wants to do have already been done. Brother Trey, we preach fabulous message. I preach a, preach a wonderful message on revival on Sunday. And I'd say most of what needs to be done has been done 
But if you leave the remnant, you know what will happen? What happened to children of Israel? God's big command has always been, don't have any other gods before me. The appeal to idolatry seems strange to me. I mean, a man, Isaiah says, goes out in the wood and he cuts down a tree. He takes part of that tree and he burns it to keep himself warm. He takes part of it, he makes furniture to sit on. He takes part of that tree and he makes a god out of it. And then he bows down and worships the god he made. How stupid. What is an idol? Is it a statue of Mary in a bathtub sticking out in front of somebody's yard? Maybe. You know what an idol is? Anything that takes the place God ought to have in your life. Imagine this. You're going to work tomorrow and they say, hey, we're real sorry to tell you this. We're shutting this branch down, the, your, your uh, company that you work for. But we do have a job for you if you move to somewhere. What's your first thought? Is your first thought, wow, I'm going to have to move. Or is your first thought, well, I may have to find another job. Is your first thought, well, I don't want to move unless it's the will of God. My children are in a good Christian school, and they've got a good youth pastor, and they've got a wonderful pastor in a great church, and they're being pointed the right direction. We've got a teen revival coming up a little bit after this, and, and the God's doing a work. Our teenagers are really sweet and tender. They pray during the songs. They had a prayer meeting before the service tonight. I better be real careful about moving my family from the will of God just for a paycheck. Or is your first thought, well, i got to have money. You ever miss your Bible reading? So on those days you miss it, did you still check your Facebook account? Might I suggest at least in that instant your Facebook got in a place God deserved. Or the television. Or whatever else you fill it in. And here's the most incredible thing. There's only one God. We know that. He had proved himself again and again to the children of Israel. He parted the waters of the Red Sea and let them walk out on dry ground. He gave them the favor of the Egyptians to spoil them and gave them all kind of goods with which they built the tabernacle. He sustained them for 40 years. He gave them water out of a rock. And he took care of every need that they had. And yet, when they got into the land, what God warned them against, they didn't listen to the warning. And it happened seven times in the book of Judges, the nation of Israel turn from God to idols to false gods to gods that have mouths and can't speak and eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear gods that are no gods seven times God to judge him bring in the Midianites or some other foreign <coughs> element to bring judgment upon them They'd cry out to God, and they'd get right with God, and God would bless them. And in their prosperity, they turn back to idols. An idol is anything that takes the place God ought to have. I want you to notice a progression here with the children of Israel as they went in the land. God gave them a command. Love me, get rid of the inhabitants. They largely complied to the command, and then towards the end, I think because they just got tired of fighting, tired of digging out and getting rid of all the inhabitants, they compromised. They said, well, we'll let them stay, but we'll be in charge. We will put them to tribute. They're going to be our servants. They're going to have to pay us taxes. They're going to have to honor us, and we'll run the place, but we'll let a few of them stay around. Eight of the 12 tribes are mentioned in the verses we read in Judges of having not driven out the inhabitants of the land. Eight of them. But they controlled them. Well, where will that? I may have a few little problems, but it's no big deal. It's not ruining my life. It's not controlling me. I'm pretty well able to handle it. But then we read 
they were controlled by them. The Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain. For they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. It's an old story I read. A man had a little act. He traveled around with a small circus. He had a python. called him Sam. The man had dressed up real sharp and fancy. He said, Sam, get out of your cage. And I don't know that the verbal command was what the snake followed, but the snake could come out and he'd wrap himself around that man, big old python. And he says, Sam, get back in your cage. The python unwrapped and go back in the cage. The man was in control. And one night, a fancy little tie tack that he wore got turned over as the snake was wrapping around his body, and the pin began to stick into the snake, and it irritated the snake. And the snake began to constrict more than was normal. The man said, Sam, get back in your cage. That python tightened up, Sam, get back in your cage. And they said, you'd hear the bones cracking. As the python crushed the man to death, he started out in control. He ended up being controlled. It's that last ungodly song you left on your phone. It's that last ungodly friendship God wants you to sever, but you don't want to give it up. It's that last sinful habit. It's that last television show you know you shouldn't watch. Some of you may know who this is. It's all right if you do. Came to our church, had rough life. He said, I'd get up in the morning and run out to see if my car was there because I could not remember how I got home. That's what the world calls fun. He got saved. God changed his life and he got victory over his habits a long time ago before he had an RU program. He married a sweet young lady and they had children. He got laid off of his job and I found out he was hanging around his old buddies, playing basketball with him most of the day. And I talked to him. I said, man, you better be careful about that. He said, I'm careful. They'll, they'll, oh, no, no, preacher. He said, I'm trying to get them to come to church. I'm all for getting people to come to church. The normal method is not to spend the day playing basketball with them. Money started missing from their account. He said somebody must have stolen their ATM card. He came to me one night and said, I need some money to fix somebody's car. If I just had this much money, I could buy the power. I gave him the money. Found out later he did that to a lot of people. The car never got fixed. Pretty soon he was deep back in the old life. In order to avoid a lengthy sentence, he cooperated with the police. Time came they were going to do a raid on the organization that he was involved in and they said we'd like you to come in we're going to keep you in a safe place jail he didn't go in he was the only one not there when the raid took place and they figured out he was the one that had ratted them out Chrissy and I with Pastor and Mrs. Jackson and our children at Bronner's before the days of cell phones an announcement came and said Pastor will that please come to the information desk they said, you need to call home. I called the babysitter, said, so-and-so called. That man had been taken out in St. Charles by the side of a road. They put a twenty-two pistol to his head. Not a big round, but easily able to penetrate your temple. And doesn't escape, just rattles around in there, and they killed him, left him by the side of a railroad track. What happened? Was he saved? Yeah, he was saved. God changed his life? Yeah, God changed his life. Did he decide, I'm going to go back to the old way of life and I'm going to end up leaving my wife a widow and my children fatherless? No, he didn't decide that. It was just a remnant. Just an old friendship that he thought would be okay. 
that last unconfessed sin, that last habit, that last thing you kind of hung on to because it really wasn't that big a deal. And you've made so many decisions and you've had such good progress and you're so much better off than you were spiritually a few days ago. The Bible tells the man who had demons cast out and the Lord Jesus said to him, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. She went to our school, never went to our church a long time ago. Got in a little bit of trouble, nothing real big. Graduated, I lost track of her. I was preaching at Camp Kobiak, and she was there, and after a service, she said, can I talk to you? We sat down in the chapel, and I sat down in one pew, and she sat down in the one behind me. She told me her story. After she graduated that summer, all, all on her way to a Christian college, a young man a good bit older than her got interested in her. The parents didn't much like the idea. But she liked the attention, and she enjoyed the uh, <clears throat> relationship. But it wasn't long as kind of pushing her to go beyond her own standards. See, he had to show her how much he loved her. Write it down, young ladies. The man who loves you will show you that by respecting you honoring your convictions, maintaining your standard, not asking you to violate your conscience. She went off to college. Wasn't there long. Found out she had to come home. She was going to have a baby. They sent her to another state where she had a relative. And while she was there, she had a miscarriage. She was married. She had children. She was in a good church. She wept in the chapel at Kobiak as she said, I'm right with God now and I'm living for God now, but I, I had to go through all that. She asked me to tell other people her story. And then she said something I don't think I'll ever forget. She said, you know where it started? No. I might have guessed it started when she disregarded her parents' counsel and developed a relationship with a young man they didn't approve of. I might have thought it started when she allowed him to push her beyond her own standards of right. She said, it started in the sixth grade when I began listening to the wrong kind of music. She said the music engendered in her a spirit of independence, of rebellion and defiance. And the music sustained in her an ability to always resist authority. Not always outwardly, but inwardly. You have to have all the inhabitants of the land. If you don't, there are going to be pricks in your eyes, goads in your side. My dad, when he ran the mission, had a summer camp for kids from inner city Detroit. Teenagers come from area churches and serve as counselors. And we always had to clean up the campground. We rented it from the state and had to have an inspection before we could leave. Dad had a little list. He'd give them on Saturday morning to get ready for inspection. And I remember one thing he always said. He said, sweep the floors twice. And you'd sweep the floor really thoroughly, and you'd think you had everything out. He said, then go sweep it again. And he said this. You'd be surprised how much dirt you get the second time. Search me, oh God, you've said that. Would you let him sweep again? might be surprised how much dirt you get the second time. Obstacles are always present. That's normal. Don't be upset by it. Don't be disturbed by it. Don't think somehow God's neglected you or been less than good to you. Victory is always possible. But the remnant's always a problem. Father, do in our hearts the work that you wish to do, please. Holy Spirit, do what I cannot do. Convict us. Bring to our mind those things that need to be dealt with. I wonder, I wonder who's out here tonight could say, Brother Willette, so far as I know, everything's right between me and God. So far as I know, there's no remnant that he's dealt with me about. So far as I know, everything's all swept out. If you could say that, would you hold your hands up high? Thank you. If you couldn't say that, would you make your way to the altar? Other folks are coming. Find a place to kneel and do business with God. Lord, help us.
do the work that only you can do. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.